All right. If you're out there on Facebook, you're tuning in. We'll be on the show here in about 45 seconds. We have a good one today. We always have a good one. This is a really good one. This is an emotional one. Very good. Yeah, we just have some insanity. Down the rabbit hole we go. We just moved. We've moved into that darn rabbit hole. I'm not going in the rabbit hole. I'm staying out. Greetings, everyone. It is Wednesday, and it is time for our show here on Taming the Wild and Your Dog. I'm joined by Kira. Hello. And Joshua. How's it going? It's going great. Well, today, uh, oh my gosh, every single time we have a show, there's just really something to discuss. I've always said you're we're never going to run out. We're just never going to run out because we find some way to sink deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole every single week. Well, today we're going to be talking, we have lots of things on the agenda. We're going to be discussing, should rescues and animal shelters tell you how you should train the dog that you're saving from their organization? And should you also have to acquire, achieve or acquire your dog's consent before you train it or you before you really do anything with it? Um yeah, it sounds a little insane, but we'll go over it. And then we're also going to do a little bit of news here because apparently uh, Australian Wally Conron, who is the inventor of the Labradoodle, says it's one of, the, one of his life's regrets. <laughs> oh, Isn't that just sad? <laughs> it is bad. So we'll, sad. we'll talk about that as well. That's, that'll be a lot of the fun there. Uh, I, I'm going to have to agree on a few little points that he makes out, but we'll get over that. And then we have some questions here. We had good questions this week. Appreciate you guys sending those questions in to us. All right, so let's just get started here. So apparently there is a little movement, and let's good God pray that it stays a little, that's sweeping across the country in which now rescue organizations, some of them, not all of them, again, like I said, it's small, but Nevertheless, that's how a fire starts, just a small little smoldering kindle, and here we go. Uh, they are now dictating how you will train your dog, like, they, like the experts that they are. They're telling you that you will not use any training method that would require any sort of a balanced approach. In other words, unless it's a treat and a harness, you're, it's game over for you and your dog you will not do it. And it's, it's really just gotten bad. I tell you what, this just lights my fire, unlike anything else. And they're actually making people sign contracts that they will not use corrections on these dogs. You know, so when you hear this, you have to call into question, what's the motive? Why? Why are you doing this? What's the big picture here? Not the little micro picture. Are you, as an organization that requires people to sign a contract stating that they will only use the training methodology that you approve, is it, is it the mission of your organization to save dogs or is it to promote your opinion, your biasness? Uh, what, what is the real motive? You know, you always have to call that into a question. Anytime something that is extremely important, uh, you're going to have varying opinions. Emotions will run high and that's when we are at our worst. Absolutely. That's when yeah. we're absolutely at our worst. You know, so I got a question always, what is the motive behind this? Especially when 900,000 dogs per year are euthanized in this country. And when you dig into that a little bit deeper, why? Why? Okay, yeah, there, we've run out of room. We don't have uh, the, the means to feed these dogs. We don't have the help to care for all of these dogs. 
But why them versus the other dog? And in so many of them, it's because of bad behavior. Not only were they rescued and adopted, but then they were given up and then rescued and adopted and then given up again. So they're repeat internees. They're over and over again. They're returned because of bad behavior. Uh, so the vast majority of dogs that are that wind up in rescues and wind up in shelters and then are eventually euthanized are done so because of bad behavior. So why in the world, I just call into question, if your motive is to save dogs, to have a successful adoption and adoption continue for many years till the end of the life of that dog, why in the world would you put such strict rules as to what you can do after the dog leaves your facility or, or your organization? Yeah, and us calling all of the motives into question is not being, you know, grand or, or, you know, drama because I've been to shelters lately and, and those, there are a lot of dogs and I've, I've talked to shelters and the people that work there and they, they're not only looking for people to come adopt these dogs, but they're struggling to find fosters, people yeah. who, who can not even fully commit to these dogs, just help take care of them. So it's not like there's not a need for people to come adopt these dogs. Yeah. You know, anytime you have strict standards. I don't care what it is, what you're promoting, what your business is. Anytime you have strict standards, the stricter they are, you will discourage any sort of participation uh, in your particular business or whatever it is that you're promoting. Uh, and therefore, when we have strict standards with regard to adoptions, then you're going to discourage adoptions. And when only in this country, in which 90 million households own at least one dog, now we take that a step further, only 40% of those dogs are dogs from rescues and shelters. That means the other 60% were typically either purchased from a breeder or at, well, at some point, that's where they came from, from, from that particular breeder. They decided to purchase a dog versus rescue a dog. So that's something to think about there. And here you are with strict standards and now you're discouraging the very thing that you're trying to accomplish. Adopters don't want to do with that. You know, if someone comes to your organization wanting to adopt, they already are trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, why can't we see that? They're already trying to do the right thing. You should celebrate people's willingness to adopt, you know, and then and therefore you should be ready to meet them where they are in terms of their attitudes and their understanding of training and pet care. You, you just have to do that. You, you, good Lord. I mean, is the country comprised of serial dog abusers? No. So in other words, we adopt too the many treats. Yeah. We adopt the attitude, shoot first, ask questions later. I mean, my gosh, if they come to you and they want to adopt a dog, that means at least at one thing, unless they're just really strange and they, they are really have a, a mental condition, which does not comprise all of us. Give them the benefit of the doubt. You know, I guarantee that if the dog could talk, it would say, hey, I'll give it a shot. You know, let, let me just at least try it. I mean, otherwise, what's the alternative? What's the alternative? Good Lord, I think when people go to rescue an animal, at least all the ones that I've known, I've never known of a single person that I ever encountered any sort of condition in which I ever uncovered I do canine pharmacotherapy. I deal with animals who are fearful and aggressive. And I'm here to tell you in the four decades I've been doing that, I've only known of one case, one case where I could absolutely definitively say this dog was indeed abused. And I could tell you exactly how it was done and the condition it created. Outside of that, we're mostly dealing with genetics. Genetics, number one, then the environment that follows through the genetics, because gen genetics uh, does not tell us what will happen. It simply tells us what can happen. And now you add poor genetics with a poor environment. And of course, now you come see Brian when you're about two years old. But gosh, you know, I have faith in mankind and I have faith in pet owners and dog owners because uh, we deal with them. And by golly, I'm telling you, they're giving it their best, man. There's several of them. That, it's amazing the links that they'll go to to do the right thing to do the very right thing. So why on earth would you tell them to use a methodology 
I don't care what you believe it is. Maybe you just say it would be bad if you told them to only use a balanced methodology. That would be incorrect of you. Let them learn through their own self-discovery. Let them give it a good college try there. And if it doesn't work, then allow them to seek help. And if you can't provide that help, then let them go to someone who can provide that help. How dare you? You get the animal, you save it. Now take the next big responsible step. Here's the dog. I trust you to take the dog. Good Lord, if you trust them enough to take the dog away from you, well, then there's this thing called faith. Hey, have faith in mankind. Not everyone's going to just come pick up the dog and use it as a lab rat. Not everyone does that. The vast majority do not, especially in this country. We know, Brian, they aren't just saying how you have to treat the dog after you adopt it. They're making these adopters sign a contract that says you will not use any kind of corrections on the dog. And if they see a photo on Facebook or anywhere else, anywhere in social media of your dog that was adopted wearing a slip collar or a prong collar or a remote collar, they will come take the dog away from you. It says you are signing this contract that says, if I use these methods, I allow you to come and take the dog away from me. It's just, it. So oh it makes gosh. you wonder, makes you wonder. How many people sign that contract? They do. They all yeah. sign it because they're forced to sign it. They're forced to sign it. And then they're forced to break it because they don't have another choice. We, ha we have dogs that come into our facility all the time that are not all the time, but in the past we have had dogs who they've gone to trainers. They've, they've tried other methods. They've tried different things and they come to us as their absolute last resort. And then they tell us, that if this doesn't work, we have to find another home for the dog. And it's not easy finding another home. That no, that other home normally ends up being the shelter. And yeah. so I can't tell you how many of these dogs that we've worked with that their next step, if we weren't able to do our job properly, was going to be the shelter. And those dogs are still with their family today. Yes. Yeah. And those are the people that I talk to on the telephone. They call me and they say, I have this dog that I rescued from wherever. They're not letting me use any corrections what do I do? And that's when they just start sobbing, sobbing. I don't know what to do. I'm going to have to give my dog up. I can't use any kind of corrections. And I tell them, we won't tell. We won't tell. Yeah. It's not about promoting us. It's about saving the relationship between the dog and the owner. So sure, let's get them signed up. Let's get them in here. Let's do what we have to do. Let's use whatever tool we have in our tool belt that's going to make this successful. And we won't tell anybody. You know, well said. Um, yeah, it, it does leave you scratching your head because I get it. If you're passionate about how dogs should be trained, you think your way is the best way. I, I think that part of the problem is with everything, any sort of organization that fails, any sort of system that fails is the narrow mindedness, the inability to be flexible, the inability to listen and to communicate and to have one motive as the common motive. You know, you're right, Kira, these people who go to these rescues, they don't go to the breeder first because, again, they're already being harassed by the public. How dare you shop when you should adopt? And so now they're pressured into adopting and they go to adopt and they just want to have a dog in their lives. I cannot tell you how many people they're only alive because they have a dog. I know these people. I know them personally. And it breaks my heart when all they need, they want a dog and they want to love the dog. They want to care for the dog, but they cannot allow the dog to attack their grandchildren, pull them down on the sidewalk to be a menace to society or to them. So they just want to do whatever it takes to create a relationship that will last till death do us part. And good Lord, get, give people a chance. I mean, adopters should feel welcome. Again, at every stage of the process, when they come in to adopt the animal, when they take the animal home, and if they feel, wow, this did not work out. I, I, I tried, I tried, but it did not work out. 
then the dog should be welcomed back and they should be welcomed. And they should be able to do this without being ridiculed, without being threatened and being afraid. This should not happen. Give people a chance and give the dog a chance. Good Lord, that's the darn thing that's like a pawn on a chessboard, having no say in any of this. Uh, I don't get it. I, go, go ahead, ahead Jerry. Go ahead. Well, I think if the dog was given a chance, he'd say, sure, I'll take that slip collar over what's the other yeah. alternative, yeah. Yeah. you know? Absolutely. Yeah, slip collar and injection. Exactly. You know, well, either way. And trust trust the person that comes in, to, like you said earlier, Brian, to do the right thing. But here's where my beef is, is I, I, not picking on shelters, not picking on vets, but stay in your lane. <laughs> There's a reason I don't give vet advice. There's a reason, trust me, I get asked it all the stinking time. I get asked it all the stinking time. And I said, I, that's a question for your vet. But I, I wish that shelters and vets would do the exact same thing. That it's not, they're not the authority on the matter. They're not the authority on, on what the proper protocol for training is or what the better option is. They, they literally don't know. And I know this from experience. I'm not just saying this. I work with shelter people on a regular basis and I've trained people who admitted that they don't know. So they came to a train the trainers course. Yeah. It's, you know, we've said many, many times on the show, it's about education, but you can't educate the uneducable. Mm -hmm. You cannot, if your mind is so closed, then you cannot be educated. You're not willing to be educated. So at the end of the day, in answering this question, motives have to be called into question. Yeah. They have to be. What is, what is the your goal? motive? You should have a defined business mission that everyone should be able to read. You should announce it proudly like ours. We say we are absolutely certain that reliable obedience saves lives. Everything and we do. That's our that's, mantra. That's what we yeah. do. And we live by it, whether you agree with it or not. Well, tell you what, we are. we believe in it so much. We have it on everything that we have. If you're a rescue organization and you're worth your salt, then put your business mantra out there. Put your mission statement out there publicly for people to read. Do not capitalize on weaknesses that people have. They come in, they're emotionally weak, they, they, they fall for this dog, and they're willing to sign anything because for them, the alternative is worse than not having a dog at all. This is the thing that's going to help me stay alive. This is the thing that I need in my life. This is the thing that my children want. And therefore, you cut, you catch them in a moment of vulnerability. And yeah, it's kind of like a coerced confession. You know, you, you just pressure them and you sign it and you sign it away. And then you get home and you come to your senses real quickly because you find out that life doesn't allow things to just go happily down the street. There are pressures and there are conditions in which no two beings are going to agree. So the dog may not agree with you. You may not agree with the dog's behavior. Someone, someone has to step up to the plate and say, I'll tell you what, well, this is just how it's going to be. Uh, and that means I'm going to do whatever I can to adjust your behavior be so that we can have a lasting relationship. And we should allow that as long as it's within the boundaries of being humane, as long as it's within the boundaries of being reasonable and it's effective, then let it go. And that's exactly what we do here. Think about all the tools we have in our tool belt to use to really make sure that these relationships are successful and they're long lasting. Yeah. That's why I wear a vest because I have to have a, the right tool for the right job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's don't get into your vest, man. The one that you sleep in and shower in and go to the beach in, go to the beach in, which is a swimsuit on underneath the speedos and everything. Wow. Oh God, that's a mental image. I don't want to see. But anyway. Okay. So, Hey, we'd love to hear your opinions on this. We really would. We really would like to stay on this, even though we're not going to stay on, on the show, we're going to move on, but we would love to have, your opinions, write it in, send it in to us here on Facebook. What do you think? Send it to me, Brian with a Y at tamethewild.com. Love to know your opinion. Maybe we're the ones that's off track. I have no idea, but love to find out. We do have a comment on our live stream. Um, and I just wanted to get your guys' opinion on it. They said, um, I would love if every adopted dog and their owner had to go through some sort of training, but set setting those specifics and um, limits and rules, question mark. Um, seems like some 
misunderstanding going on. It seems like some sort of twilight zone type future, unfortunately, because again, anytime, um, Hey, I'm reading a book right now. I'm just going to put it out there so the guys who wrote the book, they can thank me. <laughs> but uh, Crucial Conversations, if you have not read that book, I think every that should be required reading for every single person. It's extremely well done. And it just talks about, about dialogue, how dialogue helps things forward. And every time you go into this pool of meaning, meaning you have a group of people, every single person is going to bring their own attitude, their own history, their own opinion, and their own emotions, and their own way of dealing with situations like this and any successes they had in the past. So if they're a browbeater, they're going to come into it as a browbeater. If they are used to giving in, just basically do the salute and mute type attitude, that's what they're going to bring. But before we can move forward and come up with any sort of national standards, any sort of standards that would help every single dog owner on, in the United States, we're, we're going to have to have a summit. We really are. We're, we need to all sit down and come into this pool of meaning for one motive, to save, save dogs dog. and yeah. save the relationship that the human has. I mean, we count. At the end of the day, we count. I count. You count. Joshua, you count. And everyone listening to this radio show counts. We should not say that we don't count. It's about us as well. So all of that has to be taken into account. And when we do, now we can all get together. We can bring scientists in and have them bring their findings, making sure that we're all reading it the way it's supposed to be read, make sure we interpret it the way that they meant for us to interpret it, and we can experiment. And this isn't going to get done anytime soon. This is probably take well over, I'd say probably, if I had just a guess, 20 years. Why can't we start it? But I why think can't we should start it. Then we need to get this thing going. So as far as that goes, that's a great, uh, thank you for the comment. That's exactly what's needed. Now the next step is how do we get it done? That's the hard part. Mm -hmm. Well, got to try. Right. Yeah. Well, that term. So let's just move on here. Talking about consent or the descent into consent. Now, coincidentally, there is a concurrent movement being pushed by some professional trainers. And again, I've taught, said this over and over, and I will always say it. I have the right to challenge my peers and my peers have the right to challenge me. That's what makes us all better. That's, that's called accountability. Most, again, most organizations do not fail from their current processes, their systems, or their structures. It fails from the behavior of the employees and the workers. Everyone needs to hold everyone accountable. So here I am. I'm going to hold you a little bit accountable here. Uh, but apparently they are saying that uh, dog owners need to seek their dog's consent before embarking upon training, regardless of the training method. So let's just get past that. Or doing anything to their dog it may not like. Okay, so of course to me, right off the bat, just right off the bat, what does consent look like? I was going to ask that. How yeah. does the dog tell you? Is yeah. it like tail up, tail down? Well, you know, I got <laughs> I got the shelter's consent to get training done, but my dog just won't budge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, so we could laugh about it, but you know, yeah. it's really absurd. Yeah, it's absurd. Well, first of all, if they're going to put this out there, maybe it is out there. Maybe I just didn't read it, I didn't hear about it, didn't watch it. Because I certainly looked for it. I can't find anywhere. So if you're one of these trainers that is requiring your clients to get permission from their dogs before they do anything to or with their dogs, can you please send that to me and let me know what they're supposed to look for? How are they supposed to recognize from their dog? I'm giving you consent to do that. Maybe the dog is just saying, uncle, uh, yeah, I don't like this and I'm not, not for a second. But uh, on a cost versus benefit scale, uh, me basically pitching a fit is going to cost me a whole lot more than, than simply just giving in. So I, I just kind of want to know what consent looks like. I saw a video that was claiming that this is what, look at my dog giving me consent on the suture. I think you guys saw the same video, the no, no, I just said I didn't see anything. Oh, so I saw it. it. I saw it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. But the 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 sutras, um, she was doing a fantastic job at desensitizing the dog to her touching him with sutras, and she was also teaching the dog how to lay its head down and then look back up at her for a piece of food. And 
she was interpreting as when my dog lays my the head down on the couch, then then he's giving me consent to go further with the sutras. But then the dog would look back up at her and get a piece of food. And she was thinking that the dog looking back up at her was saying, hey, hey, hold off on the sutras for just a second. That's enough. That's, that's enough. That's enough. Yeah. But then it would go back with its head on. No, the dog was just figuring out, oh, this is a nice little fun game of me putting my head on the couch. And, and I get a back, treat. And then I get a treat <laughs> and putting my head on the couch and I get a treat. The sutras just aren't that bad, actually. There was no consent happening. But I, the comments and the likes on that video were, oh, my gosh, what a wonderful job. Oh, my gosh, he's so smart. And I'm sure the dog was smart. But it had nothing to do with the dog giving any level of permission. You know, and they... I guess my biggest issue with that is unless you are absolutely clear that the dog will allow you to do whatever it is you're about to do, you're in danger. Uh, I write about this. I write about why dogs attack us. Anytime you're close enough to touch a dog, you're in their critical zone. Things happen differently in a critical zone. Just like us with human beings, you round a corner and there's someone standing there with a knife. You, you, you act right then, right then. Only when they're a hundred yards away and they're approaching you with the knife, do you have other options? But when you are close enough to touch a dog, you're in their critical zone, that fight or flight zone, that immediate response zone. And it can be a conditioned response. It can be a response that's immediately formulated right then and there. Uh, so, and, and, and no two dogs are alike. So I, you know, the way I show you, or I tell you that I give you consent to do X, Y, or Z, um, doesn't mean that the next dog or you look like that Joshua or you look like that Kira. And I'm just worried about, do you, well, I thought I had my dog's consent, uh, but I didn't, you know, and I just, I just dealt with this yesterday. Um, my meeting with a client and their cousin, uh, approached a dog that was chewing on a bully stick and she tried to remove the bully stick from the dog's mouth by using her mouth. Mm. And she thought she had the consent of the dog that the dog was going to allow her to do that. Well, you misinterpreted it because all of a sudden you got bitten right in the face. So I, I, the first step in that thing is like, we were talking about Joshua. We need to approach things in a way that does not harm the animal, does not cause it to be extremely fearful because of their interpretation. How are they interpreting what we're about to do to them? We don't want anything harmful to happen to the animal, but also we don't want to be harmed by the animal. So, yeah, trying to even recognize what does that even look like? Yeah. How do I know? I think we always have to be respectful of the animal. And I mean, why isn't why is it any different than being a parent? When you're a parent, you do what's right for your children, whether or not they agree with you. And it's I, the same thing with the dog. Yeah, and and that is what happened to good old classical uh, counter conditioning. I mean, because they're using this whole thing. My dog's giving me consent to to trim its nails. What happened to just convincing the dog that nail trimming isn't that bad? I mean, if you're going to go the positive route, just just counter condition it. The dog doesn't have to be afraid of it. Convince it that when I, when you let me trim it, your nails, this really good thing happened. What happened to that? All of a sudden now we're we're going, well, my dog's nails are really, really grown out because it hasn't given me consent yet. Yeah. That's abuse. You know, and Carrie, you hit on that. You're, again, how many times we talk about that a lot of parents today are their child's best friend. They're not a parent. Uh, I, I say this all the time. Hierarchies. Hierarchies means there's no, you're not equal. There, there you're, there's no lateral line here. It's all a, a linear up and down, reinforced from the top, reinforced from the bottom. Hierarchies have merged as substitutes for continual aggression because why we were all born into a world of limited resources, which then creates competitiveness. And anytime you have competition, someone's going to win and someone's going to lose. Mother Nature said, hey, the battling over, over all of these resources, claw, why don't we just kind of put something in place that doesn't get everybody killed? And it's called a hierarchy. And therefore, that means on occasion, hey, dog, I know you're not going to like this. I remember with our kids, we yeah. say, you know, you're not going to like this, but I'll tell you what, you're going to do it anyway, because why? I'm going to save you from yourself. 
because that means I'm older. Uh, you are my charge. You're my offspring. My duty, my duty is I, I have two duties. One and the other one is to protect times. Hey, dog, you've got sutures in you. I need to remove those. Those need to come out of your body. And I'm going to do so. I do hope you like it. And I'll do try to go slow and I'll try to get it done. But at the end of the day, I'm going to get it done. Again, we when we start adopting that attitude, hey dog, I love you to death, but you're not gonna point. And yep, yep, you're not going to bite my cousin. You're not going to do this and that. Uh, we draw lines, they're boundaries. Again, I love a good client of mine, a good friend, Dr. Robert Bald, um, Baldwin. He talks about it all the time. Um, he's got a room. It's just a room. It's a long rectangular room. Oh, no, about 40 feet long, so on and so forth. And when you walk in there, it looks like an upside down flea market. And he'll take parents in there, parents that don't believe in structure. They don't believe in hierarchies. Uh, and he'll walk them in there and strap them up with all sorts of sensors. And then he'll say, okay, here's the deal. See the door at the other end? Yeah. You need to go out of it when I tell you to. When you step out of the room, you're here with the intercom, go out the door. And they're all thinking, oh, piece of cake. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in the way. There's some upside down desks and chairs and so on and so forth. Uh, but anywho, piece of cake. Okay, so he steps out, turns off the lights. Pitch, black, dark. And of course, you know what happens from there. Ouch, oh my gosh. And there's some words I'm not going to repeat on the radio show occur as you run into the upside down desk and the chair. But invariably... All of these parents find their way to a perimeter wall. And when they do, they hug that wall and feel that wall and travel down that wall till they find themselves out the other door. And then later when he meets with them, they calm down. Their stress response is lowered. And now they're thinking clearly. He says, you know what that wall is? Structure. Structure. We must have it. And that means you must have it for your dog because your dog depends on that. They thrive on hierarchies. Hierarchies give predictive information, which allows me to have control and so on and so forth. So again, at the end of the day, yeah, I'm going to go easy. I'm going to do it in a way that I, in the best way I can, just the very best way I can. But if I overdo it, my bad. If I underdo it, oh well, I need to learn from that as well. But either way, when it comes to your welfare, that's my charge. You're my dog. And I will make sure I take care of your welfare and sometimes it's going to be tough love. Sometimes it's going to be that easy love. But either way, if I don't do that, then I'm not the responsible pet owner and I shouldn't have a dog. I agree. Well, you always say that some is always leading. So if if we as the, the guardians aren't going to lead the dogs, then I guess the dogs are going to lead us. Yeah, yeah isn't that, it, that's kind of weird as well. You know, so now you're looking to your dog for consent. So where does that put you? I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you need to sit back and think about that. Maybe while you're not looking at your dog, your dog can't hear you. Uh, go out somewhere, share a beer with somebody or whatever, and just say, hey, I had to ask my dog's consent to do this training with it. Uh, what does that make you? And you certainly don't. That I tell you what that makes you in front, as far as the dog's perception goes, weaker than it, which then means in case there is danger, perceived danger, meaning there may not really be danger, but the dog thinks there is because there's someone unfamiliar to it walking through your front door. I need to just take this into my, my charge. I need to take care of this because you're too weak to do so. That's the way it works. The big strong wolves take care of the grizzly bear that's trying to excavate the den. It's how things work. And this is how your animal works. So when we're weak, when we act weak, then to them, we are weak. And when we are weak, they now take it on them. It's, it's, they own it. I will deal with the threats. I will take care of things around here. That's not, that, that shouldn't be how, how it happens. Well, let's take the example of just what happened just this week when we sent a dog home who came in, who was very, very nervous, very, very insecure. What did we do? We gave it structure. It wasn't uh, treats and things like that that we gave this dog. It, I mean, we did give it treats, but mo most importantly, it was structure. It was rules and boundaries. And when we sent the dog home, I called the family to check up, make sure everything was going okay. And it wasn't the, the behaviors like the sits and the downs and things like that that, that blew their minds. When, they, when I called them, they go, you know, the behaviors are great. Heels, best, best walk I've ever had. But What's most impressive is this dog used to tuck tail and run and hide in another room anytime we moved furniture, anytime we, you know, they got a trash bag out and she's just 
sitting over in the corner on her placemat, as confident as can be. Yep, that's what structure and that's does. Exactly, it what structure gives you does. again predictive information, control, and so on and so forth. All right, guys, what we're going to do now is kind of decompress a little bit because now we have a little bit of a funny story to go over. But we're going to take a short break, get a little bit of water. I uh, suggest you do the same thing. We're going to come back and talk about why. I, Wally Conron regrets having ever invented the Labradoodle. And then we got some questions we got to hop into. So we'll be back in just a couple of minutes, guys. Thank you. The Facebook feed looks um, pixelated. Oh, it does. It's not going to show it accurately on... Uh... Hey, comment if you guys are getting um, some pixelation. Are you guys seeing everything okay? Yeah, let us know. Audio it's coming usually, in okay? It's a master fix on everything. I, I master fix everything. Very choppy. Yep. Mm. Is pixelation a word? It, it is, is now. now. <laughs> <laughs> Jinx. <laughs> A pixelation. Ashley said the audio has been spotty in a few spots. Well, that's just irritating. Yeah, that is irritating. Really irritating. Spotty in a few spots. Hmm. <laughs> Maybe it'll work itself out. I doubt it. <laughs> Who knows? I didn't run a speed test. I think my face got all red when we were talking about that. I'm glad I took my coat off. So I got hot. I wish I'd left the fan on <laughs> and kept the air down low. Ah. So I master fixed the pole thing too. You did? Yes. So can you master fix the everybody, pixels? Everybody live, there's gonna be okay. a there's gonna be a poll that please participate in. Let, let us know what you think. Okay. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, now we want to talk to you a bit of a funny story, and this comes from the United Kingdom Independent, and it's an article written by Joanna Whitehead. And she reports that the man who created the world's first Labradoodle has spoken of his regret in creating the most popular mixed breed dog, describing them as crazy Frankenstein's monsters <laughs> prone to hereditary problems. Now, you know, I got to admit, you know, we, well, heck, we run in every dog breed is Frankenstein's monsters at some point. I mean, you, you get just you get crazy dogs with every breed. But, you know, when I take all of the training calls, the sales calls for Taming the Wild, and these people call, and if they say, yes, I need some help with my dog, and they start crying, I go, oh, do you have a Labradoodle or a Golden <laughs> Doodle? <laughs> what kind of doodle do you have? <laughs> yeah, and then they're amazed. They go, how do you know? Well, <laughs> how do you think I know? Because we see these little Frankenstein's monsters all the time. No, I really, I, I personally think they're really cool dogs. I do think that, yes, they can be super, super energetic. It's like their fur's on fire. <laughs> yeah, it's like they need medication <laughs> for a condition in which they can't settle down. I've but, always said that they fall on one end of the spectrum or the other. I've met some great... Great, great Labradoodles that are just cool, calm, and collected, confident, really easily trained, and they're great companions. And then, but the other, the other one that you meet is just off the walls crazy. Yeah, it's like there's no middle ground. Yeah, no <laughs> middle ground. either no that middle one ground. or the other one. But mm -hmm. apparently, Australian Wally Conron bred the first Labradoodle. The name was Sultan in 1989 as a guide dog for a blind woman whose husband was allergic to dog hair. And uh, he said that while he was doing so, he spent three years trialing poodles as potential guide dogs, but found they didn't have the same temperament as Labradors. So to try to resolve the issue, he ended up breeding two dogs to create the popular pet. 
Uh, and then in 2014, the mixed breed pups were allowed for the first time to enter the prestigious U.S. Westminster Kennel Club dog show for the first time in its 138 year history. So, you know, they're they're on the map. They're here. They're here to stay. They're around. Uh, but like you, Joshua, he said, I do see in this quote unquote, I do see some damn nice Labradors, but they're few and far between. Yeah. Uh, and this is the guy who who created it. And, and he goes on to say, you know, his decision, he admits, uh, has done a lot of damage and described the dogs as his life's regret. He goes, I realized what I had done in a matter of days. How do you know oh, that? No. <laughs> I mean, it must be really bad when in just a matter of days, you're going, what in the heck did I do? Uh, another one of his concerns I remember was just the, the mixing um, and what he's encouraged long-term to mix the, the poodle with all types of dogs, irresponsible breeding, which he's so right. If he noticed that in three days, I mean, I literally just saw the other day a, a Irish wolfhound doodle. I mean, it's, it's getting out of control. Now Are you serious? Yes, I'm dead serious. Oh, I don't know what that looks like. I'm curious. I know, me too. <laughs> I think that's why they decide to breed some of these. They, yeah. they want to see what it'll look like. Uh, and also, like he said, people are just breeding for the money. Some people are. Now, again, that was a real big, you know, one, one, one way statement there saying people. I would use the term some people yeah. are just breeding for money. Unscrupulous breeders are crossing poodles with inappropriate dogs simply so they can say they were the first to do it. Now, I do think that is, to a degree, accurate. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's trying to carve out your own little niche here in a $70 billion a year industry. How can I squeeze in here? There's a lot of a lot of competitors in here. There's a lot of stuff going on in here. And it's kind of like hopping in an elevator that's only supposed to hold eight people, but now there's 28 in there and you've got to get in there. You're trying to squeeze in. And also there's just human curiosity. Yeah, they're doing a science experiment. Yeah. But at the dog's expense, these things are born. They live, they breathe, and it just can't be a science experiment. Yeah. Well, here's the most shocking thing of all. So many of these people are getting these dogs because of their their sensitivity to the dog's allergens. And they're finding out that the, you know, the offside reason for the dog's popularity is their hypoallergenic fur, which reduces allergic reactions in humans. However, however, <laughs> experts at the Henry Ford Hospital Department of Public Health Sciences concluded that this was a myth. We found no scientific basis to the claim hypoallergenic dogs have less allergen, said Christine Cole Johnson, senior author of the study. Hmm. So I'll make you scratch your head just a little bit. Again, I am the first to tell you I know for a fact. Why? Because I have furniture that gives it away like CSI. You know, you can put duct tape around it or scotch tape and do a body line. We do have dogs who have this doodle type fur, a couple of them. And yet, when they lie on a certain piece of furniture, you could do a chalk line right around their little bodies to know exactly how they, they lay. So, again, you, if you're going to, if you can do that, then there are going to be some allergies. You aren't talking about the rats, are you? I mean, they're perfect, right? No. They I don't shed? No, 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 they're perfect. They don't shed. They don't bark. Yep, yep. They're perfectly trained. I don't even think they poop. Yep. So, that is, so, on that note, let's move on there. That was your funny little story there. Let's move on to some questions here. Kira, do we have any questions this week? We have just a few. Okay. So here you go. When walking my two dogs at the same time, my older dog will go berserk when it sees another dog. And when I correct him, he will attack my younger dog. What is going on and how do I stop him from doing that? This is called stress-induced displacement of aggression. Uh, again, a couple episodes ago, we talked about how you have to have an outlet for frustration because when you become stressed, you will become frustrated. It's just part of life. Well, guess what? The other dog is the block of wood. Mm -hmm. Remember when I said that the rat was put in the cage, given these little shocks, and then they measured a stress response. And then over a period of time, they get wood. And when the shock went off, the rat ran over, bit into the block of wood, and his stress response lowered. So uh, the, the rat actually started becoming healthier. We see this all the time. This is an outlet for frustration. And it can happen. We, we see it at windows. Two dogs are at a window and they're going off on someone walking by. And all of a sudden, one turns and bites. Anything that's a physical barrier, I want to run out there. I want to get to that dog. 
I want to get to that person. And you look like you really want to do it too. And I'm really getting frustrated because this darn glass won't give, this door won't give, and that leash won't give. And in fact, on top of that, not only will the leash not give, but someone is yanking on it. So the, either the person walking the dog or the other dog suddenly becomes the proverbial wooden block. <laughs> and now all of a sudden they sink their teeth into that. And that's what that is. Just stress-induced displacement of aggression happens in the entire animal kingdom. That's why wolves came up with what we call the Shakespearean effect, feigned helplessness, because all of a sudden when you guys determine that I'm the block of wood, I'm going to go, oh my God, you're killing me, you're killing me, killing me. And then you'll back off because you're going, oh, I don't really want to sink my teeth too deep in that block of wood. And when you walk away, I hop up, dust myself off, I'm back on back in business. This happens. Welcome to hierarchies. Anytime you have a hierarchy, the lower ranking animal is going to be a block of wood. And that's what's going on here. So it happens all the time. Okay. So how do you make it go away? First of all, you have to deactivate the animal's aggressive response, which means if the animal is becoming frustrated because it's encountering other dogs, then you need to work your dog away from other dogs so that it understands that when you give it a signal, for example, no, leave it, sit down, something of that sort there. That's what my focus is. That is the priority signal. That's what I now do. And when you do this, you won't be frustrated because you're doing a command that will now achieve a great benefit for you. And that's where counter conditioning comes in. So now once the dog passes, that's when you say, well done, sir. Well done, my, my girl. And then you give them their treat or pet or whatever and go on about your way. But you don't try to train this initially under the very conditions in which the animal is trying to attack something or it's extremely frustrated from the stress that's coming on. Because again, remember, if you feel like you need to attack somebody, then your stress response is through the roof. You are in the reactive zone. So you've got to work with the dog so that it develops a conditioned response to a given signal, which means I don't even have to have my brain turned on. When that signal happens, kind of like a red light, you're driving a car, you just stop. Regardless of what's going on, I don't care what's being played on the radio, who you're talking to on the phone, you just come to a stop. Do that first, create that conditioned response, and then start to work that conditioned response around the provocative event or the stimulus at a distance. So you have to, it says we have time to get things done. But when the thing's right up on us, we don't have any time. Now that, that creature or that human has now entered your dog's critical zone. So work on a conditioned response to deactivate its aggressive response, do it away from the provocative event or stimulus until the dog is doing it very, very good. Then start to slowly introduce it to that uh, provocative event or stimulus. And when you do that, the animal will no longer be frustrated. It won't be frustrated. It knows exactly what's going to happen. It has predictive information. This dude's going to tell me sit. And if I don't sit, there's an outcome that doesn't work out well for me. Uh, but if I do sit, there's an outcome that works out terrific for me. And and now that I'm calm, meaning I can think clearly now because my stress response isn't going as high. So now actually my cognition is enhanced at this moment. I start to realize through my own self-discovery, wow, the outcome I was hoping to achieve, meaning by going rah, 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 to make go away from me. So when I'm seated on the sidewalk or I'm lying down, that same, the very same outcome occurs. And once they learn that, here's the neat thing about dogs. They only carry one suitcase with them into the future called winnings. They drag around one called losings. Only we humans do that. They will switch their modus operandi. There will no longer be any sort of frustration and this will get done. So that's how you do it. Cool. Okay. I tried to take a sock out of my dog's mouth and she bit me. How do I teach my dog to let go of something that she shouldn't have without being bitten again? Okay. So what is this, Joshua? Uh, you didn't ask for its consent. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, that wasn't the answer I was looking for, but oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. anywho, I, I realize you're on that track. There. Funny, funny. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, competitive aggression. The leading cause of aggression on the planet are both humans and animals alike. 
like. Uh, so again, I kind of gave the example of a girl trying to take some, a bully stick out of a dog's mouth, using her mouth. She just entered into competitive aggression and she lost. She got bitten, dog kept bully stick in the story for the, as far as the dog's concerned. Uh, that's what it is, is competitive aggression. You, we, you always have to keep in mind that the value of whatever that dog is competing over is within the eyes of the dog. You don't, just because it's not food related, just because it's not a, a favorite dog toy, the dog can protect or compete over whatever it wants at that given moment. Oh, yeah. It'd be no different than right now if a tub of cottage cheese land between you and I and I looked over it and you look like you wanted it. I'm just going to give it to you. Right. I don't care how you try to take it with your mouth or whatever. But there's if not, a, oh, sorry, there's not as many times in which the people get bit because they try to take the bone away. It's always these socks or my own shoe or or the kid's toy or whatever. It's not things that they walk up to the dog thinking, oh, the dog's going to bite me over over my shoe. It, no, it, they never think about those types of things. Well, values internalized. Yeah. And like an example I was given. Now, all of a sudden, a Reese's Cup lands here, and you look like you want it. And I'm I will to, want it. Yeah. And yeah. You and oh, I, I have gonna, one. Why don't we just <laughs> test it out? <laughs> and, and, we, and we're going to get it on here because I place a lot of value on that, and I think I can take it from you. So anyway, it's uh, so you're dealing with that competitive aggression. Uh, they will always run this thing to a cost versus benefit analysis, meaning that the other person wants the same thing that they want. Then they are going to determine, well, what's the benefit of me keeping it? How much do I value this thing? What am I willing to do to keep it? And then once they've run it through that, the next filter is, well, she looks like she wants it as well. But do I think I can keep her from getting it? Do I think I could win this little battle? And if your dog checks off all of those little boxes, you can guarantee this. You will be attacked if you go for that item. So, again, always pick battles big enough to matter, small enough to win. Sometimes a dog has something in its mouth and you can go, oh, fine, you can just have it. You know, it, it, it was an old shoe anyway. I didn't like it. And I was going to throw it out or give it away. So you can just have it. But outside of that, here's how you train it. One, treat, uh, well, what do I Let's just say, I, we use the word out, but yeah. so many people use I, drop it, leave it. I really don't care what, you could say scuba dog for all I care. You need to develop a communication line between you and your dog that when the dog receives this particular signal, whether it be out, drop it, leave it, how you gesture, whatever, then we create a conditioned response. They just spit it out. Um, you know, we, our dogs are very well trained on that. We were playing around the other day and... One of our dogs picked up, uh, I think it was mulch or who knows what it was in our backyard, but he has severe GI issues. So we, he cannot have anything, nothing at, at all outside of his food. Uh, so the minute he picked it up, I yelled out and our cattle dog who had nothing in his <laughs> mouth goes, Poo! <laughs> and it's just, wow, he had nothing, but his, his mouth ejected something. And I don't know if it's just air, if it's spittle, whatever it was, but that's the kind of conditioned response that I'm talking about. And that can be achieved through multiple ways. You are, you will at some point have to force it because again, you can't go all positive on this because the treat you're holding may not be as valuable to that dog at that moment as that sock that they're about to ingest. So you got to, you're going to have to go up this a little hard here and that, Hey, I love you death dog, but you need to spit that thing out of your mouth. Cause if that goes down the hatch, that's going to kill you. So you need to let go of that right now. And the only way that's going to happen is if there's some sort of severe cost or some sort of cost where the animal goes, you know, I'm not willing to incur that. I'll just spit it out. It's not worth it. So you got to get that thing done by doing that. And a lot of ways we do that with, uh, you know, so many ways, a uh, compression collar that you can apply, apply pressure. They let go. Then you release your pressure. You reward the animal. And remote training calls. That's, That's the probably, easiest way. Uh, yeah. By far the easiest way because it allows safest. you. The safest. Because, you know, no one has a leash on their dog all the time. And now I can touch you up to a half a mile away from here through windows, through walls, whatever. Those things have the ability to have no effect on the dog whatsoever. To I guarantee you, they will say uncle. And that thing will, will fly out of their mouth. So I'm saved by the ability for me to have them release. And I do mean immediately that thing that was in their mouth. I remember that time that Max grabbed that um, entire bottle of Remedil, you oh, know? Yeah. And I thought that was going to go down the hatch and had, I don't think I could have gotten to a veterinarian hospital in time. They could have opened him up in time to save his life. 
So you, you just have to do it. We humans try to keep things away from our dogs, but you know, get good luck at that. You'd be amazed at what they can reach, okay. where, what they can climb on, what they can get their mouth on, and what, what they're, they're interested even, in. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was going to say. Is I mean, you, you're like, really? You, you want that? that? <laughs> Training that. Reach out to us here. We'll be glad to help you. Even if you live on the coast or it doesn't matter. Welcome to technology. We can meet you online. I can say, hey, how you doing? You look great. The dog looks fantastic. And let's get busy here. Let's go to work. We can do that. We do that all the time. So make that happen, guys, because that'll save your dog's life. And not to mention, again, all you have to do is hop into my book, The Hammer, How Dogs, uh, Why Dogs Attack Us and How to Prevent It. And you'll read a story about William Monroe and how he died from competitive aggression with his pit bull. Yeah. So anyway, we're here to help you. Uh, we did have one more question. We ran out of time. We next got really, week, we'll I'll get on to it next week. I promise. In the meantime, you guys have a great week. And Joshua, just real fast, tell them where they can find us. Uh, YouTube, subscribe, hit the not notification bell. Um, that's Taming the Wild with an all capital wild. Um, and Instagram, Facebook, like us, follow us, and you'll see more of us. Do it, guys. We got a lot of good stuff coming out. I hope you have a terrific week. We'll be back here next week. And next week, the title of the show is Think Inside the Box. Oh, that's going to be really interesting. So we keep digging up all these little jewels here. Hope you're enjoying them. Hope you're learning something that's more important, just beyond the enjoyment, that I'm learning something that can help me and help my dog. Have a great week. Take care. Thank you. Sounds good. See you next week. All right. For those of you hanging around here, you laggers out there, <laughs> um, definitely we'd like to get your comment because, you know, I like that idea, Kara. Uh, I think that somebody finally has to stand for something. Well, I think if we start it, we'll have people follow us. They may not like it, but well, we, on board. we don't need just follow. We need support. Yeah. We need social support. We need people to hop on and say, wait a minute, what the heck is going on here? I thought we were after the welfare of the dogs, not my promoting my own little political biasness or what have you. I, you know, I, I just wonder some days what happened to us? What happened to thinking, being reasonable, exploring things from many many possibilities. Having an open mind. You know, in, in, in an open mind and being curious is what drives science. It's what drives all of this research. And any time you are performing re research, you always keep at the forefront of your mind. Have we covered everything? Do we miss anything? Or do, is this test appropriate for this particular species with its given cognition, its given age, its natural and spontaneous abilities and behaviors? Did we take everything into account? Did we? It's part of it. So I think we need to sit back and, and challenge one another. Respectfully. Respectfully. You betcha. Nothing gets done when you're throwing elbows and everything. You, you got to challenge one another and say, hey, 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 hey. I, I understand where your heart is. I get it. I know you you care so deeply about these dogs that are being adopted from your organization. But can we just sit down for a little bit? Again, away from the dogs. Because anytime you sit around looking at a dog, you never make the right decision because you're now thinking with your heart, not with your brain. And we sit around and we just have a chat. Let's talk about and, it. And adopt the idea that that being proven wrong is just as good, if not better than being proven right. I mean, when you yeah. are proven wrong, you learn something. Yeah. You know, That's we could certainly ad adopt a real throw the elbow attitude. You know, after all, you, what do you think? If, if I come up and adopt the dog and you're telling me that I can't use the training methodologies that I know has worked for hundreds of thousands of people over the last four decades, you're going to tell me that. What do you think I am? What does that say about me? I don't have good judgment. I don't know what's best for the dog. I'm an abuser. So yeah, I could certainly take that stance and I could take that approach, but that sidetracks us from what is the real motive here? The real motive is to put as many of these rescue dogs and shelter dogs into homes where they can live safely and help 
the families in which they live. Help them. If anything, just lower their darn blood pressure so they live a little bit longer. That, if that's our motive, then we would get that thing done. We would get that done. We would find a way to get it done. We'd be like JFK said. He says, you know, when we talked about about going to the moon, and everyone said, that's going to be an impossibility. That's never going to happen. We're never getting to the moon. And JFK said, well, yeah, we are, and here's how we're going to get it done. We're going to throw our derby over the moon. And what he's referring to is that an Irishman loves his derby. He loves it so much that if he ever comes up to a brick wall that he can't seem to climb, he'll throw his derby over that wall. Why? Because I'm going to get my derby back. By golly, I'm going to get my derby back. And so he will find a way to get over that brick wall so he can get his derby. We need to throw our derby over the proverbial brick wall of this madness in the pet industry. And if we have that attitude, we'll get it done. Oh, we will get it done. There's nothing that we can't get done. So anyone out there wanting to join us? Join us, but we will make this official. We'll we'll get this thing done. Don't it's not gonna happen tomorrow. We're gonna give it the due diligence it deserves and the clear thinking it deserves and the ability to put it out there and promote it in a way that's respectful of all individuals. But by golly, we will get it done. I'm tossing my derby over this wall. There you go. All right, guys, we've been on here long enough. You got anything to add, Joshua? No, I think you said it. Anything here? I'm good. All right, guys, we are out of here. We got to go. I got to go find my derby. It's somewhere <laughs> back in my closet. Got to go <laughs> dust off a little bit, and then I got to get to chucking it over a wall. You guys have a tremendous week, and we'll see you next week when we're going to be thinking inside the box. Have a good one.